Okay, I would like now, before going to unsupervised learning, to show what's happening when you don't only have translation but another group. So take the example of a group which is going to be both rotation and translation. So you don't want to be just environment to, rotate, to translation, you also want to be environment to rotation. So the roto translation group, which is just a rigid motion group, acts on the signal by rotating it and translating it. Now what's it's a bit more difficult is that you don't have a commutative group here. However, everything goes the same. How do you make an environment on translation, linear environment? You just average, okay? How do you make an environment of a rotation and translation? Well, you are going to average your signal over all translation and rotation. So it's a convolution, but a convolution on the group, rotation and translation. What have you lost? High frequencies, the high frequency variation along uh, rotation and translation. How can you capture it with a wavelet transform? but you build your wavelet transform on the group, and that's not difficult. We know how to do that on basically any type of group. Now, once you have that, you just go and apply the same recipe. You begin from x, apply the wavelet transform. So now you have a function which depends upon scale and rotation. Now I'm going to consider that as a function of rotation and translation. t here is my two-dimensional variable, uh, uh, t1, t2, my special variable. And now I apply this new wavelet transform, and that corresponds to what you were saying. What is that doing? It's not just making a convolution in space, it's making a convolution also along rotation. So it mixes together, again, in the spirit of the kind of thing that uh, Jan is doing, it mixes together all the elements within the same layer, okay, through this convolution. And then you iterate. You can do the same thing relatively to scale, and then the convolution is going to be along rotation, scale, and spatial variable. So if you do that on a database, this is UIC, which is a more difficult database because you have a lot of variation in terms of scale within the same class, rotations, and so on. If you just make an invariant in translation, the error remains big. Why? Because you have too much variability that is not captured by a linear operator. If you add up the environments to rotation, the error goes down quite dramatically to 2% and to scaling to 0.6%. So that's where you see that the adaptation is important and plain vanilla uh, translation wavelet won't be sufficient. Okay, and here we are arriving to uh, the issue of unsupervised learning. That's good if you know the group, but what if you don't know and you just have data? How can you think about this problem? So what we would like to do is to learn this operator phi from the data. Now one has to realize that unsupervised learning is a horribly difficult problem. What does it amount to? What you have is your unlabeled data. And really the, thing, the only thing that you can do is basically learn about the probability distribution of this data. But the problem is that P of x, you are in very high dimension. x is in dimension 1 million. So there is no hope to learn p of x with local computations. And that's the dramatic problem. All the classical techniques which are based on clustering and Gaussian mixture models don't work. Why? Because they are based on local modeling. And you cannot do local modeling in high dimension because locally you have nobody. You have one point, two points, that's about it. So, what is these techniques doing? What I are basically trying to do is to take your distribution and make a pavement of this distribution like that. What I'm going to show is that we're going to do something completely different. We are not going to try to make a pavement of that. We are going to compress the outside space in order to build models of the distribution. Okay, and you begin with x0. Okay, I'm trying here to build a model of a stochastic process, okay, of a probability distribution, which corresponds to all possible realization of my data, unlabeled data, okay, for example, images of YouTube and so on. So I'm first going to introduce this generalized scattering and then we'll see how to learn it. So the idea is that I'm just going to replace the operator W1, which was a wavelet transform until now, by any arbitrary operator which is a tight frame, okay? So W1 transpose W1 is identity. 
So first, I'm going to do exactly like I did. I'm going to get out the expected value of x0, subtract it, transform it by my linear operator, and take the absolute value. That defines x1. So what does x0 do? Just the data matrix. The data. This is a row data. Is one a realization of x0 is one image. Okay? And different realizations are different examples in your database. Okay? And expected value means an averaging over all the realizations. Okay? It's the averaging across the realization. Okay, now you have x1. Yes? Nothing. Well, I'm describing an algorithm, so it's possible. <laughs> I haven't yet said what was, uh, OK? I, I, what you're right, in, I'm going to translate your question. It's impossible to model any probability distribution like that. Right. That's absolutely right. But I'm still going to, it may not be good, but I'm going to do it, OK? So I'm, I'm taking x1, and then I just repeat. I take the absolute value exactly like I did. I subtract the absolute value. I apply my new operator W2, absolute value, I get x2. Okay? And I'm going to do that for any m. So xm consists in taking xm minus 1, suppressing the mean, transforming it, taking the absolute value. Okay? That's the thing and so on. So that's my expected scattering transform, my scattering moment. That's the output. And what I'm saying is that I'm now going to model my probability distribution from all these expected values, OK? Now, what is, so when you have a family of expected values, you can build an approximation of the probability distribution with the Boltzmann theorem, OK? By saying, I find the p of x of maximum entropy, which finds that. And this p of x might not be a good approximation of the real p of x, but you can at least try. Now, the very important thing here is that I have the same structure. This is contraction. It's a series of contraction. So what you can prove is that it's a contractive operator. That means that if you consider this is a deterministic vector, OK? The Euclidean distance of the deterministic vector for x and for y will be smaller than the distance of x minus y measured with, expected with uh, uh, mean square average. And the second thing, this is exactly like the conservation of power spectrum. If you sum all these moments, you recover the expected value squared of your random process. So it does converge. OK, now how can you learn? And what's the logic of learning? The point here is that each time we contract, and that's where uh, the, 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 the difference of uh, uh, really view uh, relatively to what Yann you presented is at least in this framework, there is no need to live in a low dimension, any regular manifold or any such thing. The point which is very, very different from Gaussian mixture models or these things is that we are not going to be interested in modeling that, but compressing emptiness where there is nobody. Each time we are going to iterate, we are, going to try, we are going to compress the space. But what we are going to do is compress the space without compressing the data. Why I don't want to compress the data? Because afterwards, I'm going to do classification. And maybe these two points belong to two different classes. So if I collapse them together afterwards, I cannot classify. So I'm going to try not to collapse the world of data, but I'm going to collapse the rest. That's the idea. So you compress, compress. And once you've compressed everything, you can renormalize, and boom, your data is living everywhere. OK? So the key point is the following, is to observe. What is the volume of the data? Well, the volume of the data is given by its variance, OK? The variation between x and minus 1 minus the mean, norm squared, that's the volume, expected volume. Now, if you look at the reduction of volume from an iteration m to m plus 1, can verify very easily that it's exactly the scattering coefficient squared. So if you want to reduce very little the data, you want that to be as small as possible. And you want that your coefficient be as small as possible. Now, what does that mean? For each m, we want to minimize that. We want to minimize the volume reduction of the data, not the outside space. 
Now, how do we compute Xm by applying the operator Wm on Xm minus 1? Okay, that's the iteration. Okay. And here we basically have an algorithm which is very close to a sparse autoencoder. What's happening? Given, suppose that we've already learned um, until the layer m minus 1. What we want is to minimize the next layer, this expected value. But this expected value is the transformation of the previous layer with this operator wm, absolute value. And what you see is you want to minimize this quantity. And this quantity is an L1 norm. It's an L1 norm across realization. What does that mean? That means that you want to build an operator which is going to create features such that all these features are not excited together. If these features are interesting, that means that sometimes they are excited, but not too often, to be discriminative. And that's exactly what that's saying. You want to minimize the L1 norm. That means that each feature should be excited from time to time, but not all the time. Okay? And if you do that, then you are going to each time minimize the synergy, and you are going to optimize your contraction. At the end, all your space is going to be essentially occupied by the data, and the elements of the data won't be squeezed. OK, so that's basically what you get then. You iterate like that. Now, if you want to do supervised classification, this becomes completely non-informative. Because what are these things? These things describe the property of the data world. But when you want to do classification in this data world, you are interested whether this element is different than this one. You are not interested whether it belongs to your data world. So these are given, it has been learned, and you just subtract, and you get your output, you do a linear classifier. And if you renormalize, basically instead of having a horribly complicated uh, um, frontier, you can hope that your frontier with a linear frontier will do the separation. Now, under what condition this is true and so on, to come back to your question, that's a very interesting uh, uh, mathematical question. There is right now, that's what, what we're working on, we have no, no result, but we can, what we're, we've been doing is slowly trying to see what kind of distribution can be recovered from that. In 1D, we can prove that we have many distributions that can be recovered and we are working on that. Yes? Of what representation? The, the dimensions of the vectors at every step. Oh, of these ones? <laughs> Very uh, good thing. Uh, it has probably to be uh, optimized. Yeah, I mean, it can be any operator of any Rn, Rn plus 1. How to optimize them? Yeah. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting issue also. In some sense, you want to optimize them. The, whole, the, the point of view here is you want to optimize them so that they squeeze so that it gets you the best sparse representation in some sense. That's really, it translates into sparsity here. Yes? Here. That's the output. No, these averages are, uh, are just given by the unsupervised learning. Yeah. That's specifying the world of data. Okay? Now, when you want to classify, you want to know within this world whether this is different than this. Okay, so that's it. Now, this phi of x, if here you put wavelet coefficient, you can show that this phi of x will exactly have all the scattering coefficient that I described. It's at the end, but in fact, it's, it's a rewiring. So you get all the scattering coefficients that I described. This is a, really, if all these w are wavelets, you get exactly the scattering transform that I previously described. Okay, so we tried to, we, we, we are trying to see, if you have something like a Swiss roll or something like that, I have no doubt that you'll do much better with a manifold uh, Laplacian, which is much finer technique, okay? This is pretty brutal, okay? You are cutting your space, boom, flipping things around with the absolute value. It's very brutal. It's brutal, but it's very high dimension. It deals with high dimension. It, it, it doesn't have the subtlety that you can get with a manifold learning algorithm but it deals with very high dimension. So how much does the picture actually vary from realization to realization of your data? Which one? 
This one? Okay, in, you see, uh, one point here, one, no, no, one point here is an element of your realization, okay? In blue, I showed all the realization, all the signals of my signal world. I'm sorry, this is not an image. This, this is a represent... Well, uh, the shape of... Okay, let me say, this is not... I'm showing that as a regular shape, but this is really a nuage... It's a cloud of points, okay? And the variability of your elements in your data set will translate by the fact that this is a horrible cloud. That's what I was not say saying. It's not a manifold. This is a horrible cloud. And what you are basically saying is that because your cloud is horrible, don't try to model the cloud. Try to see where there are things empty and kill emptiness. You are try we, are, we are approaching the problem from the outside because the inside is too horrible. Or you mean this? Random remapping, but if you random remap, what do you want to get? I'm thinking, okay, I'm just here. Uh, so then you have your initial points, yeah. and you assign them to each one to a random location in the 0, 1 to the power of minus 2. Yeah. Yeah, the problem, you are not allowed to do anything local. That's what it is hard. That's the, okay, there is a magic about sparse coding that often people don't realize, is that what, what is very tempting, we were discussing with Lorenzo about that, is to do local PCA. Local PCA you can't do because it's local, you are in high dimension. Sparse coding is a completely global learning thing. Any vector depends upon everybody. And that's the reason why it works in high dimension. It's very, very global. Let me show why it won't work on Caltech. This is, uh, why it won't work on Caltech? Because we don't deal with cloud. We don't deal with cloud. OK, it will work on that. This is our dear president, so that was important to work on him. And, uh, but the rest is still working. Why it works on these things? Basically, all the information is there. It's not about the fact that it's homogeneous or whatever. There is no clutter. The problem is when you deal with Caltech or Pascal or ImageNet and so on, these elements which are important, you want to recognize, are in the middle of a lot of clutter. And if you average, you are dead. You are mixing things you don't want to mix. And that's where Max really is, in, is getting to be uh, interesting. So I must say I have a kind of love-hate relation with Max. I've been working a lot with Max. Max edge for edge detection, Max for uh, matching pursuit or extraction from dictionary. The problem with Max is it's very hard to do the math. And it's really very different. If you take a Max and an expected and an average, you don't get the same thing. The average is going to converge to something with low variance. The Max keeps all the variance. So it's a very interesting problem to see how can we do the, ma the, the math. It's not just another pooling. It's completely different if you do a max or uh, you do an averaging. But obviously, it works incredibly well, uh, as Jan has showed. OK, so conclusion. Uh, so several points. We try to answer partly to the questions. The, the first one is, why wavelets? Wavelets are good for deformation, but deformation is not a detail. All the issue of dealing with geometry is the issue of deformation. I worked a lot like everybody who is above 50 and working in computer vision on edge detection, okay? We all worked around edge detection for our thesis and it was a big failure. Why? Because edges move around and when there is a deformation, it's very hard to compare things. The geometry has to deal with stability of deformation and that's one of the things which is hard and that wavelet gets it. The other thing is that wavelets provide sparse representations for the first layers so that's another good reason because it doesn't compress the data world. So this scattering transform uh, that I've described is basically providing, as I said, a contractive nonlinear operator 
which we implement through this deep convolution or non-convolution network, <coughs> if it's not convolution. And as I said, then you can do the math. Uh, unsupervised learning, sparsity is really getting important here. But as I said, for me now, uh, the real difficult mathematical frontier is the max. Or replace the max by something else, but something that can deal with clutter, which is, of course, basically detection, how to incorporate detection. Just a comment. Uh, there is a lot of belief in science, and one of my beliefs is that anything interesting in mathematics will appear at one point or another in physics. I mean, it has to be around in the world. Uh, so we've been using and looking at that for the analysis of nonlinear PD. And if you look at nonlinear PD, the big difficulty for the analysis of nonlinear PD, in, in particular Navier-Stokes and turbulence, which remains a completely open problem, is the issue of deformation. You have a flow, and the flow is getting deformed, and it's very hard to track that mathematically. So what we're currently doing is trying to analyze that kind of PD with that kind of techniques. And it would be interesting if there was a relation between the physics outside world and the inside world of the brain. I mean, who knows? That, that, that may not be a completely crazy idea. OK, so I'll, I'll finish on that. And thanks very much. Yes, no answer. With the way Jan presented dictionary learning related ideas, aside from the assumption of manifold, so the example of trying to you know, put energy on the set and not very big outside, and then so it looks like there is some similar. Yeah, yeah. Take away the manifold part, it looks very similar. I wonder, in his list, there was a lot of stuff, some of it was clustering. No, no, yeah, it's what, similar yeah, yeah, what I'm, uh, okay, I should, I should say, when I came back to research, I was, I lost myself into a startup for a while, and then I came back 2007. I was struck by the existence of, uh, first of all, computer vision began to work, it never happened, and I consider there are very beautiful ideas around. This very beautiful idea was kernel learning, SIFT, which I think is an amazing idea of David Law, uh, convolution uh, network, and I was, a lot of influence by these max and the uh, age max structures uh, that uh, Tommy had been putting on. Basically, what I've been trying to do since then is try to do the mathematics uh, around. What I've observed is that each time I was trying to develop an algorithm that was different from the algorithm that had been developed, it didn't work. Okay, so I've stopped that. I'm not anymore trying to do anything different from what these guys are doing. I'm trying to do the same thing, simplify it if it can, and do the math. So yes, if the, 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 the question is, uh, is that similar uh, to what Jan has been completely, completely in the same sense that uh, this uh, deep neural network is just a particular case of uh, the structure that he has been doing. Where I disagree, because of course it, I cannot agree all the time with him, it would be uh, uh, boring, is that it has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, manifold. And the beauty of this whole thing, I think, from my point of view, is that exactly it's able to deal with structures which are not manifold. And from my point of view, it's opening a total new field in probability theory. Because suddenly, I mean, think about it. Characterization of stationary random process is probably the oldest topic in probability theory and statistics. It's everywhere. And still, what are the tools we have? basically moments, and we are screwed when we go beyond second order moments because the variance is too big. Okay, we can't do it, deal with everything. And then suddenly there is an opening. You, ha you are able to have tools which are mathematically can be handled and deal with them. So that's why we first began with the case where everything is fixed, wavelets, and you can deal with a certain thing. And then of course the next frontier was learning. And, uh, and we're still not very far from understanding uh, the kind of thing that these guys are doing because we don't deal with max. And that's why we're saying max is the problem. It's, it's not just max, though, because it really is like you have, you have this tree that's going on. Uh, but beyond the, the convolutional architecture, the, at the next level, all the nodes function. I mean, there's this thing where the where? It, have color channels. Yeah?
that? Yeah, because W1 speaks to everybody. The W. Well, that's what you're trying to learn, but the, uh, but the scattering. Oh, the scattering. Go you're go right. The yeah. scattering. Well, the scattering uh, basically is saying the following thing. If you have a group, if you have groups, wavelets are enough. And uh, if you, for example, do groups, which is translation, rotation, scaling, then still you speak to everybody because the nodes are going to speak at a given layer. You're going to filter a lot across rotation, a lot scale, and in space. So basically everybody speaks to everybody. You see, the, you, you are not before the first version, you just speak in space, but now you speak in space, in rotation, and so on. And I have a tendency to believe that the second layer is basically going to do that. I don't think, I have a tendency to believe you don't need to learn the first layer, you don't need to learn the second layer, you need to learn the third layer. Yes, you don't agree. Can you rephrase what you just said? I should immediately get that. <laughs> so if you have uh, oriented edge extractors, right, then you will have solved that by, uh, but you have one dimension, which is orientation, and you can do composition indefinitely. And that's the same as uh, increasing multiple dimensions of the complex. Multiple, you have multiple So that's, I think that's what you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Too bad. Too bad. <laughs> or, or maybe I convinced you. Why don't you say that? That would be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, I think we should take a break. I mean, we're already over time. So come back in about 15 minutes. Come back for, for Tommy's talk. So.